Tantor Audio, a division of Recorded Books, presents The Lost Lieutenant by Erica Vetch Narrated by Mary Sarah Chapter One Seton Estate, Berkshire, England January 4, 1813 You'll do as you're told if you know what's good for you. I won't be humiliated again. Diana Seaton gripped the back of the chair she stood behind, grateful to have the piece of furniture between her and her father. Red suffused his face, and his eyes glittered. He paced the oriental rug in front of the fireplace in the drawing room of Seaton Manor. She gathered her courage. But wouldn't it be better if I remained here this season? I could look after Key and do not mention that name here. Not his, and not his trollop of a mother's. The Duke of Seaton halted his pacing and jabbed his beringed finger toward Diana. Her pleas wadded into a lump in her throat and fierce tears pricked her eyes. Her half-sister, Catherine, hadn't been a trollop. She'd been an innocent, a naive debutante, taken advantage of by a true rake and scoundrel. A mistake that, had word gotten out, would have cost her reputation and in the end had cost her life. But Diana knew better than to protest aloud to her father. It's bad enough to have her spawn here in the house. At least she had the decency to die and rid us of her shameful presence. I wish both of them had. He stopped to the drinks cabinet and poured himself a whiskey, though it was barely ten in the morning. This would be a bad day if he was starting his drinking so early. Diana only wished he didn't mean it when he said he was glad his daughter had died in childbirth. But she had too much evidence to the contrary to deny it. The Duke of Seaton was at once a womanizer and a woman hater. He had not loved any of his three now deceased wives, marrying them for either their fortune or the power the alliance would bring him. Each had borne him a child, and he hadn't loved any of them either. He was not capable of love. Only power, control, and cruelty. You'll go to London with your brother and me. You'll be presented at court, and you'll marry the man I choose for you. Beyond that, keep your mouth shut and mind every rule. There had better not be so much as a hint of scandal attached to your name, or you'll regret it. Your sister cost me far more than she was worth. Outfitting her and bringing her out last season... She barely lasted until Easter, before she was compromised. I had almost brokered a marriage. The bids were set to come in, and she ruined it. If you do the same, you'll regret the day you were born. The skin tightened along his jaw as he glared. Brokered a marriage, sold into bondage would be more accurate. And such a fate awaited her too. She would be his pawn, and she had no say in the matter. The lump in her throat grew. How could she keep her promise to her sister to care for Kean as her own if she were in London, married off to a stranger, when the baby was here in Berkshire, under the dominance of her father? Her thoughts scrambled as she tried to subdue the panic in her chest. She had to ask, What will happen to the child? He'll stay in the nursery here until I decide what to do with him. I should have sent him to the orphanage the day he was born. It was a threat he had uttered for months before the baby's birth, as a means to keep Catherine in hiding, and one he'd breathed often in the three weeks since Kean's arrival in order to quell any rebellion on Diana's part. The worst was knowing he'd do it, either in a fit of rage or as a calculated move to bring someone under submission to his will. And will we stay in London the entire season? She infused her voice with innocent inquiry. Of course. It takes time to arrange a marriage and a proper society wedding. After you are presented at court, I'll start the negotiations. Once I find a suitable husband, your sponsor will take care of the wedding details. He waved his hand, as if what happened to her after the wedding were of little consequence. Diana must be careful here. If he thought she was manipulating him, a shudder went through her. Are you worried about news spreading in your absence that there's a baby at Seaton Manor if you're not here to quell the gossip? 
He had gone so far as to forbid having a midwife or accoucheur in attendance at the bath, for fear of word getting out. And when complications had set in, neither Diana, who was completely inexperienced, nor Mrs. Hudsworth, the housekeeper, had been able to prevent Catherine's death. Perhaps bringing the child to London, where you could have more control over who might learn of his existence. She hated herself for even uttering these words but it was all she could think of to sway him. If you turn him over to the orphanage here, everyone in the village is likely to know where he came from. But in London, there are many orphanages, and you would be assured of anonymity. Her father's gaze narrowed over the cut glass tumbler, and she held her breath. Beyond the heavily curtained windows over his shoulder, snow fell in fat flakes. Two weeks too late to give them a white Christmas. Travelling to London would be arduous, even if the snow melted soon. The roads would be a muddy morass. She should be excited about a trip to the capital, a place she'd never been. Though her entire life had been spent in preparation for the event. She should be eager to wear the elaborate gown created for her appearance before Queen Charlotte at court. About attending the social events, about meeting new people. She should be anticipating an escape from Seton Manor, where the mullions and muntins in the windows might as well have been prison bars and the dominance of her father. And for most of her life, she had expected this season to be her emancipation. But now all she wanted was to stay, to stay hidden in the Berkshire countryside with a newborn boy she loved as her own and had promised to protect. <clears throat> You could be right. Tossing him into a London orphanage would be easier if we want to keep it a secret. Father set the glass down hard on the rosewood table. Very well. Tell the nurse to get ready to travel. We leave in the morning. Waiting until he strode out, slamming the door in his wake, Diana rounded the chair and sagged onto the brocade cushion. She felt like a rag doll with all the sawdust leaking out. Elation that Keen would be coming along, warred with fear that she had only hastened his being placed in an institution, and clamminess swept over her skin. Lord, help me find a way to keep him safe, to keep my promise to Catherine. It was a prayer constantly in her heart and on her lips. But did praying do any good? Was God listening? Did he care about an illegitimate child that nobody but her seemed to love? Diana had never been certain that God cared about her prayers, or that she was of enough significance to arouse his interest. When Diana had been small, her nurse had prayed aloud, but only that Diana would be a good girl and not tax the nurse's patience. The rector at the girls' school Diana had attended had read all his prayers from a book, as if he were bored. Only the assistant matron in her dormitory had taught them that God wanted a personal relationship with them through his son Jesus, that it was right and proper to read scripture and pray from the heart. How Diana wished she and Miss Bonham to talk to now. Diana prayed, but she sometimes wondered if her words reached any farther than the chandelier, since nothing she had prayed for seemed to have changed her circumstances. Before she could summon the strength to rise and head to the nursery, the drawing room door opened again. Her heart leapt to her throat. Had her father returned? Had he changed his mind about taking Key in with them? She straightened and folded her hands in her lap, lowering her chin to present the properly demure daughter her father required. But it was only Percival who sauntered into the room, giving his gold top cane a twirl. She hated that cane. He pretended to need it whenever he wanted to elicit sympathy but his ankle was well healed by now. Her half-brother might like to act as if he had suffered a great war injury and that somehow it made him a romantic figure, but Diana knew the truth. There was nothing romantic about her brother beyond his good looks, and even those were tainted by the character she knew lay behind the facade. Was there such a thing as an honourable man in all of England? A man without a cruel streak? an uncontrolled temper, a need to dominate every woman in his life. Not in Diana's experience. 
admittedly limited as that might be. All men were alike, forceful, controlling, and unpredictable of temperament. Fetch me a drink. Percival dropped to the sofa, swinging his legs up, propping his dirty boots on a satin pillow, clearly not caring about the servant who would be tasked with removing the stains he caused. I'm worn out. She straightened, ready to flee if he started toward her, fed up with his sneering demands. No one broke your legs on the way downstairs. Get your own drink. Aren't you feeling saucy this morning? He tapped his cane on the rug. If I weren't so tired, I'd give you a smack to remind you of your manners. Has the trip to London got you all in a lava? I might be too if I was silly enough to think that getting married would solve any of my problems. Father's already got a list of prospects. All old, fat, and in need of an heir. I don't envy you. Saying nothing was often the best defense, and Percival baited her. So with an effort, Diana bit her tongue. Percival dropped the cane to the carpet, raising his chin and staring at the plaster filigree work on the ceiling. You don't think he's going to give you that inheritance money, do you? The minute you marry, it won't belong to you. It will go to your husband. And only as much as father has to shell out to get somebody to take you off his hands. The rest you will pocket. It's been his plan all along. Percival pinched the bridge of his nose as if bored with dealing with such an inferior intellect. It's galled him right along that he couldn't get his hands on your trust. But if you think he's going to turn over thousands of pounds sterling without a fight, you don't know our dear father. Frustration boiled under Diana's breastbone. Her hands fisted on her thighs. Her grandmother had left that money to Diana to be inherited upon her marriage. The old woman had done it to spite the Duke of Seton. Revenge for the way he had treated her daughter, his third wife, and Diana's mother. Still, having a debutante sister will fit nicely into my plans for the season. It's a good excuse to show up at parties you're invited to. And I'm sure there will be a few swains willing to do whatever I want them to, in order to secure a formal introduction. Your looks are passable, and you are a duke's daughter. We should be enough to have them swarming around. I shall have to see how I can leverage things to my advantage. He rubbed his fingertips against his thumb and grinned. Sheep to the slaughter. I hope you last longer than Catherine did in town. I missed out on several opportunities to fleece the young bucks at the table when she scuttled home. Whoever ruins her better hope neither father nor I catch up to him, since he cost us so much money. He stacked his fists and twisted them in a neck-wrenching pantomime. Before she said something she might regret, or that would earn her the aforementioned slap, she stood. There was plenty to do in preparation for tomorrow's leave-taking. She'd waste no more time on Percival, or his hateful words. The notion of him making suitors pay for an introduction to her, of having him show up at every social function she attended, and of luring unsuspecting prey into gambling with him in order to get on his good side, made her want to break something, preferably over his head. She slipped out of the drawing room and through the hall to the staircase. Upstairs, the servants went about their packing duties quietly and quickly, trunks and boxes open and spilling their contents, maids hurrying to Mrs. Hudsworth's directions, and everyone tense. The servants at Seaton Manor were always tense, it seemed, like Diana herself. What would it be like to live in a peaceful, happy home, where people were kind and treated one another with respect? Did such a household even exist? From the sounds of her father's plans to marry her to the highest bidder, she would never know. I don't see how you're going to make sense of all this by tomorrow. Have the lists I made helped? Diana touched the gowns lying across her bed, letting her fingers trail over ostrich feathers, tulle, satin, and silk. Several of the dresses were leftovers of her sisters, never worn after she fled London last spring. But the rest had been sewn for Diana's debut, 
by a seamstress imported from the city for the purpose. Diana had enjoyed the process of collaboration with the modiste, selecting fabrics and trims, adding her own special touches. Though Diana had been sequestered at a girls' school for the past several years, she had always had a flair for design, and she took pleasure in the tiny sense of freedom making her own dress choices had afforded. She'd been popular amongst the girls at school for her taste and creativity. Then her father had summoned her home, ostensibly to be with Catherine in her confinement. But Diana surmised it was more than her father feared. He was losing control of his daughters and wanted her where he could watch her. Don't you worry, dear. We'll get it all sorted. And your lists have been most helpful. No, not that trunk. That's for the court dress. Mrs. Hudsworth shook her head. Do you want any of your books and art supplies parked? Diana didn't hesitate. I want everything. If things go according to Father's plan, I won't be returning to Seaton Manor. I don't want to leave anything behind. Not that she had much beyond the clothes she would need for her debut, and she could argue that those did not really belong to her. Her father had been reluctant to spend money on daughters, even for necessities. Leisure items were rare indeed. Diana had her school books and a few sketch pads and pencils, but little else to call her own. Even her mother's jewellery, which should have passed to her, had been confiscated by her father. Mrs. Hudsworth's lips trembled. She took a deep breath. I'll miss you, lass. Diana squeezed the older woman's fingers. Something her father would be shocked to see. One didn't treat servants with familiarity. She left the parking in the capable hands of the housekeeper and climbed the stairs to the nursery. A fire blazed behind a protective screen and the nurse her father had reluctantly hired sat before it. Her toe slowly rocking the cradle on the floor. The girl couldn't be more than fifteen, but she had the necessary skills to care for the baby. Being the eldest of nine, the daughter of one of the crofters on the Seaton property. Father had refused to hire a wet nurse, but thankfully, Kean seemed to be thriving on thinned cow's milk. Beth, you and the baby will be accompanying us to London, so I need you to park Kean's things and have them ready to go before the first light tomorrow. Diana bent to the cradle and lifted the warm sleeping bundle. She inhaled the newborn scent that still clung to him, closing her eyes for a moment, her heart torn with love and worry. The girl's eyes grew round and a flush suffused her pale cheeks. London, miss? Yes. His grace has relented and he wants the baby where he can keep an eye on him. The same rules apply. The less you're seen, the better. Keep Keen as quiet as possible, because if his grace feels like he's being inconvenienced, he might ship our darling to the nearest orphanage. Diana's arms tightened around the baby, fear wriggling its chilly way up her spine. She had to do whatever it took to protect Keen. Tiens, attrape, bandit. Evan Eldridge bolted upright in his bed his arms sweeping wide to fend off the advancing enemy, only to make contact with the bedside table and send a porcelain pitcher flying across the room. The blankets wound round his legs, trapping him, and he kicked free, pain piercing his thigh like a bayonet. He lashed out again at the French soldier, shouting, Get back! Sweat prickling his chest, his ribs pumped like bellows. Blinking, swallowing, he shook his head, trying to clear the panic in cobwebs. An orderly rushed down the ward, scowling. What's going on here? This is a hospital, not a melee. He didn't wait for an answer, bending to pick up shards of pottery and mopping up spilled water. No French soldier. No cannon fire. No smoke or broken, bleeding bodies. He wasn't on the battlefield of Salamanca. He wasn't fighting for his life. He was in the hospital, still. Sorry, bad dream, he muttered. It was as good an explanation as any, and partially true, though he didn't remember falling asleep. 
His heart hammered against his breastbone, and he forced himself to take slow breaths, willing the panic to recede. The dream had seemed so real, he could almost smell the burning gunpowder and hear the shriek of the cannonballs as they whistled through the air. A bad dream that seemed to repeat every time he relaxed his guards and fell asleep. Evan dragged his hands down his face. He couldn't admit what was really bothering him. He couldn't talk about the cold sweats, the panic, the nightmares, the memory loss, the flashes of anger, the sense of impending disaster that he carried constantly. If he breathed a word, he'd find himself on a one-way trip to Bedlam. He had hopes of getting out of St. Bartholomew's soon, if he landed in Bethlehem Hospital for the Insane, where others with his malady had been taken, he'd never get out. He held his hands out flat, palms down. Tremor shook his fingers, and he had no power to stop them. Every sudden noise had him jumping out of his skin. Pulling a handkerchief from his dressing gown pocket, he wiped his temples. One would think, after enduring the sweltering heat of Spain, He'd be suffering from the cold of January in England, but the ward resembled a furnace today, though no one else seemed bothered. The soldier in the court next to him lay under several blankets, and one of the orderlies stumped by, a coal hod banging against his leg as he went to feed the fire. Evan rolled his neck, trying to ease the knots that had taken up permanent residence between his shoulder blades. Perhaps if he could only get a decent night's sleep, this internal jangling might cease. But at the moment he felt like a box of musket balls that had been dropped from a height. Bouncing, rolling, scattering. The French had a term for it. Vent du boulet. The wind of the bullet. A term for a soldier who heard bullets even when he wasn't under fire. Someone who was losing his grip on reality. Evan had seen such men. Vacant expression. Quaking muscles, jerking movements, unable to eat or sleep or cope with the world around them. Evan feared that was happening to him. If he couldn't bring himself under control, he'd be thought unfit to rejoin his regiment, unfit for command. Or worse, insane and in need of incarceration. A familiar squeak drew his attention. The cart with the protesting wheel. Why didn't someone fix that? Every meal, the same thing. Squeak, squawk, squeak, squawk. Hailing the arrival of pathetic food grown cold in its journey from the basement kitchens to the wards. Morning. The porter removed the cover on the kettle and ladled out a bowl of pasty-looking slop. Gruel again. Stuffing the handkerchief buck into his pocket, Evan accepted the thick porcelain bowl and heavy spoon what he wouldn't give for a slice of bacon or a piece of toast with butter. Doctor's orders. With a shrug, the porter moved on. Squeak, squawk, squeak, squawk. Evan lifted a spoonful of porridge to his lips. But at the monotonous taste of bland nothing, he let the utensil drop. It was ridiculous, him even still being in the hospital. His leg wound had nearly healed. He should be convalescing at his father's parsonage in Oxfordshire, where his mother could fuss over him, or at the company barracks, preparing to rejoin the 95th on the peninsula. Six months since the battle, and being shipped back to England was long enough to linger in a sick bed. In fact, compared to the others in the wards, those with amputations, blindness, burns, bullet wounds, Evan felt like a fraud. Few headaches and a nearly healed shrapnel wound in his left thigh were nothing. Setting aside the ball, he levered himself upright, tightened the belt on the dressing gown. A luxury his father had brought to him when Evan arrived at the London hospital, and began his slow, determined walk to the far end of the ward and bark. The sooner he regained the strength in his leg, the sooner he could get back to his men. On the march again, sir. He stopped at the bed of Freddy Cuff an infantryman with a cheeky grin. Freddy always had a quick word for everyone on the ward, even though he had lost his right leg. The young man struggled to pull himself up in the bed, and Evan hurried to adjust pillows. How are you feeling? 
like I'll be joining you on your walk soon. Maybe we can have a race. Freddy's eyes twinkled. Doc says he's going to fit me with a wooden leg. As soon as this thing heals up enough, waving in his abbreviated limb, he sighed. Not much use for an infantryman with one leg, though. Soon as I'm healthy enough, they'll discharge me. Then what am I going to do? Can't go home to my folks. They barely have enough to live on themselves. That's why I joined the army in the first place. No job, no training, no money. It was a question he posed early, it seemed. With a twinge of guilt, Evan parted Freddy's shoulder. Something will come up. You just work on getting better, so we can have that race. Freddy's condition, one shared by many veterans, made Evan more grateful than ever to have survived his wounds, relatively unscathed, and that he would be back in uniform soon. He too had joined the military because it was one of the few options open to him, and he'd found a home with his fellow soldier brothers, one to which he was anxious to return. Not to mention, there was still work to be done on the continent that wouldn't be finished until old Boney was dead, or behind bars. After six laps of the ward, up from yesterday's five, Evan's legs trembled, especially the left. The fresh scar burned and ached where a battlefield doctor had dug out shrapnel and splinters and later had reopened it to drain infection. Evan didn't remember receiving the wound. He didn't remember anything about that day. And yet something drifted at the edge of recall. Something important. Something urgent. Or was it just his adult brain playing tricks on him? He couldn't trust anything his mind conjured up at the moment. He sank back onto his cot and swung his weak limb up with the help of his hand. Breathing heavily, he shook his head. If his mates could see him now, weak as a half-drowned kitten, they'd laugh and tease the life out of him. Where had all his strength gone? The strength that had enabled him to march, ride or climb, whatever the terrain and situation called for, carrying a heavy pack of supplies and ammunition. Evan was the best sharpshooter in a regiment of sharpshooters, or at least he had been. Again he held up his hands, noting the tremors. How could he shoot straight if he couldn't even hold his hands still? What if he never regained his ability? God, you wouldn't do that to me, would you? Evan had only ever half.